uh, do an interview with you for this book that I'm writing about Gresh Johns? Yeah, I don't know much about that stuff, but uh, I'll give you what little I know. Okay. Um, how I've been doing it in the past is just getting the, the guys to talk about the um, uh, other Gresh endorsers. So if I can, I'll just run through this list and you can tell me if there's anything you remember or would like to say about them. Would that yeah, be okay? Okay, yeah. All right. Um, Billy Gladstone? Oh, he was the finest uh, snare drummer I ever lived. Supreme artist. You saw him perform at Radio City? Yeah, he, well, I saw him in Boston. He was doing My Fair Lady then, but I never got a chance to see him at Radio City. But he was he was a big drawer on himself in Radio City. He had his own technique, built his own snares, built his own pianos. That little light that goes on a refrigerator, that's one of his inventions, I believe. The, the vibraphone pedal that dampens the vibraphone, that's Billy's invention. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the light at the end of the baton, that's Billy's invention. I think doctors use it now. Uh, special key chains he invented. He invented that great snare drum, which is still the best drum ever made, you know. Did he make one for you? No, no. He, I had three of them. I had a big black concert model. I don't know where I got it. Frank Ippolito gave me that. Then I had I one up with Maury Fells. And I one up with Marty Gross. Uh, Marty Gross. Marty uh, Grupp's drum. And I had another one. I had four of them. Huh. Yeah, I had four of them, yeah. I had a beautiful one uh, that was uh, I got from uh, Marty Grupp. That was a beautiful uh, Gladstone. I bought all of them, you know. Uh huh. And one of them was given. Two of them were given to me. The Maury Fowles snare drum was given to me. He had a, I had a whole set of them. I used them on Mary Griffin show for years, you know. So I understand now Carl Palmer has that set. Well, that's, uh, that's, I think that might be uh, either Shelly Mann's old set or one of the Gladstones that was up at Frank Eppolito's shop. He had that set. I think it was a Silk Sparkle. I've got Beautiful that set one. Of drums, yeah. I've got that one. The oh, you got that one? Yeah, the silver sparker I've got, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I thought Carl got that. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, that's a beauty, isn't it? Well, it doesn't... That was a small bass drum, wasn't it? Yeah, it doesn't have uh, the right snare drum with it. It's got Cozy Cole's snare drum. I think... I think it was well, you that told me that... Well, that's a Gretsch Gladstone. Pardon me? I think he had a Gretsch Gladstone, Cozy. I'm not sure. No, his was a... It was a, a Billy Gladstone, Gladstone yeah. Oh, I well, think you were the one that told me, though, that Butch Miles has the... He has my, uh, uh, my, my Gladstone. The yeah. Maury Feld one. Yeah. That's a good drum. I had to do a couple little things different to it, you know. I had to put another rim on the top, you know. Right. And that's all. But everything else is about the same. The bottom rim is the same from way back. Uh -huh. So he has that that drum now. Yeah, he's got it. Hmm. Or so he says he has it. I don't know. <laughs> um, how about Chick Webb? Uh, I never heard him before his time. Okay. No, I never heard him. Joe Jones, Philly oh, Joe. Oh yeah, here's uh, uh, Philly Joe or Joe. Philly Joe. Billy Joe? I'm yeah. sorry, no, Joe Jones, Papa Joe, Joe Jones. Joe Jones was a, right. was a Gretchen daughter way back. Right. Way back. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. Joe was, uh, I think he and George Whittling are my two favorite drummers. And Billy Gladstone, naturally. I still try to pra practice some of those techniques Billy had. <laughs> They're right. awful hard to get down. Man. Right, you right. Know, oh, Jesus. He was a fine pianist, too, you know. Right. Yeah, he was just good at everything he did. He made his own pianos. I don't believe this guy. <laughs> Some hotel room would be in town for about six weeks. He'd make, build a piano up there in his hotel room. Ah. Oh, what a guy. Jeez, what a guy he was. What made Papa Joe one of your favorites? Oh, what? well, he just did everything better than anyone else, and it was all his own technique, you know. Had his own technique of playing. Yeah, in a great technical facility besides that. And he was just a great drummer, a great brush drummer. King of the hi-hats. A yeah, very tasty drummer. At the end, he got a little bit sugar, you know. But uh, uh, in his heyday, he was I thought he was the best drummer around. I liked him better than anybody. Better than Sid, or better than uh, anybody. Better, hmm. better than Buddy, and better than anybody. There's some records that Lester Young made. On one side, the old 45. One side is Buddy Rich, and the other side is Joe Jones. And the difference is striking. You got to hear it to hear the looseness Joe Jones plays with, as opposed to Buddy. You know. Right. What about George Wetling? You mentioned. Oh yeah, he's had the most. That's the most musical guy I've ever heard on a on an instrument. You know, set of drums. He was. He had what. He had the kind of a sound that Billy liked. You know. He'd get the same kind of a sound without Billy's technique, you know. Mm -hmm. Had his own technique of doing it. And uh, he's just a superb player. Jeez, he made everything so musical and fit in so well. His, his flow, his, his beat was a... We were listening to him to Metropole one night. He was playing the intermissions with Woody Herman's band. I'm standing by the cigarette machine with Woody. I says, boy, I says, I'd like to show sure, like to be able to play like that guy. And he says, you'll never be able to play like that guy. <laughs> Years on oh, whoa! Yeah, I said, yeah, you're right, you probably won't. He says, besides, it wouldn't fit with the band we got, you know. Right. Who was Wetling playing with at the time? Oh, he was just playing with a bunch of stiffs. Oh, that night he happened to be playing with uh, Salt Jaeger or somebody like that, you know, replacing Roy Burns. 
But he was a far superior drummer to Roy, you know. He's just a superb drummer, that guy. Jeez. You said with Saul Yeager? He might have been with Saul Yeager. Uh -huh. that At night. the Metropole, yeah. I don't yeah. think he was with Red Allen. I think he was with Saul Yeager. Uh -huh. Oh, one of those, oh, Max Kaminsky, one of those bands. You know? Uh-huh, uh-huh. But he was, the, he was the highlight of it. He was just superb. Hmm. Nick Fatul. Oh, yeah. Well, he's got the same kind of a sound as George. I mean, he's, he's the West Coast George Wendling. He doesn't have quite the swing or feeling that George had, but superb drummer. Superb drummer. He's an old pal of mine, too. In fact, they both were, but I, I don't see Nick much anymore. He's still out here. Yeah, he's he had a beautiful sound on, on the drums, you know? Hmm. He's not doing so well. I, I, he, I, well that's I, what they say. Yeah, but he's still as funny as ever. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's a great, very funny guy. Dave Tuff. Yeah, I guess he was the king of them all. That's what Woody said. You know, he's the best ever. And I heard a record uh, with this live air shot with uh, Teddy Wilson and uh, Benny Goodman, Lionel Hampton, and Dave Tuff on the drums. Dave was just playing the brushes. He swung so hard on that that Benny even threw in the towel. You know, Benny and Teddy, but Lionel Hampton uh, is too stupid to know when to quit. You know, he just, he just played forever. You know, just him and Dave playing. Damn, God, Dave Tuff was unbelievable. Hamp was up there stomping away when... The good old days when he was playing music, you know. Yeah. Was just a, he's the original rock and roller, you know, Hamp. Right. But, uh, geez, that Dave Tuff, what a fucking drum. He's just playing the brudges, man. Mm. Hard swing. Mm. Oh, great drummer. Great drummer. I don't know if you'll recognize this name, but Alberto Cauldron. He played with no. Xavier Cuda. Cuga. No, with, with, with Coogie? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I okay. knew some guys at Coogie, but uh, uh, not him. Mm. Shelly Mann. Oh, yeah, a terrific drummer. Yeah, he's one of Billy's ace boys. <laughs> Billy's ace boy. He had a nice sound out of the instrument, too. A very sound conscious drummer, you know. Very sound conscious drummer. Perfectly steady time. I don't think he ever rushed or dragged in his life. <laughs> he never rushed away? I don't think he ever rushed or dragged in his life. Yeah, anything. yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he's in his own way of doing things, too, uh -huh. you know. Remember, he had to compete against Buddy Rich and Max Roach. They were the two kings of the drums during that particular time, and he he come up, come up with his own way of playing. Huh. One of the most original drummers in history. Huh. Always was. Very good thing. Very good brain, that guy. <coughs> and a very, very nice guy. Dick Shanahan. Yeah, he's still playing. He still sounds terrific, too. Jeez, he sounds real good. He's a good drummer. Good swing, swinging drummer, man, you know. Gets a good sound. Just a good drummer. Solid. Yeah, solid player. Very good time. Very good feeling. Kenny Clark, Clue. Yeah, he's uh, one of my idols. Yeah. That's who I pattern my uh, style of uh, time playing after, is Kenny Clark. How would you categorize uh, well, <laughs> Woody Bailey calls it an airborne propelling beat. <laughs> That's what he calls it. Who and said that? Woody Bailey. <coughs> and I'll tell you, it's, uh, Kenny Clark's got a great cymbal beat. And the record you should listen to for him is uh, the uh, Miles Davis, earlier Miles Davis stuff of, uh, with uh, Kenny and Percy Heath. The stuff that was recorded by that real good engineer in New York uh, up, up, uh, out of the city a little bit. What the hell was this guy's name? He's an excellent engineer. He's the guy that brought the drums and the bass so you could actually hear them on a record, you know. Huh? And Kenny's brush playing was very good on some of those things, too. Yeah, that was Dizzy's guy. Oh, I think that was really Dizzy's favorite drum over Sid Kevin. I think he liked him best. You know? Right. You don't remember this engineer's names. He was really the one that yeah, brought Rudy Van Gelder. That's the name. Rudy Van Gelder. V-A-N-G-E-L-D-A? Uh, E-R. Van Gelder. E-R. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Gelder. Huh. So he was the first one to put the drums... Oh, and you can really hear the... Ah. Uh, hear the, the, the drummer and the bass player right together with that real beautiful beat they had. Kimberly Heath and him had a great beat. Uh-huh. And, uh, geez, it sounds great. If you just hear those records, they're great, but not for me with Miles Davis, those records, Sonny Rollins, Erichin, and then the uh, uh, walking with, uh, say, Percy and Kenny, and I think it was uh, Horace Silver on the piano there. Uh-huh. Or Monk, or one of those guys. Uh -huh. But they just... Kenny Clark sounds just great on those. Just great. Hell of a nice guy, too. Huh. What was his fix on, on Paris? What, 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 on Paris? Yeah, why, why was he, he so taken? He the country. I don't know if he had to leave the country. He didn't have to leave the country, but he went over there, and he, and he owned Paris. He owned France. Yeah, yeah. He's the top guy in Europe. Yeah. He is. Huh. And, well, he should be, you know? Yeah. Never got his due here, though, unfortunately. Uh, well, he did. He was just one, of the, one of the pioneers, but I must have something must have happened where he had to leave town or something. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine leaving then because things were going pretty good then. He had all the record dates sewn up and he was the number one guy, you know. Right. Shadow Wilson. Oh, fantastic drummer. Jesus. I would rate him next to Joe, you know. Great sound he got out of the drum. That's him on Queer Street with Count Basie. Right. You ever hear that? The Buddy Rich says the greatest two-bar drum break he ever heard in his life. <laughs> 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 it's a bitch, too. 
man, you know, it, it's great. Well, what a great drummer. Yeah, the guy who should really talk to him about Shadow Wilson is uh, Illinois Jackett. He loves Joe Jones and Shadow Wilson. Jeez. Shadow Wilson, what a great drummer. Jesus. <laughs> but I think Joe is even that much better, tell you the truth. Wow. And Shadow was a fantastic brush player, too. He was great with Errol Garner, you know. He's the one that really got that. And Monk. His original hot drummer with Monk. Another great brush player, Denzel Best. Oh, yeah, he might be the best of all, of all brush players, you know. Uh, I patterned my brushes after him, Kenny Clark. But Denzel Best, definitely. That's the first big influence I had on brushes. <laughs> first big influence I had. Lost Art. Yeah, well, it isn't. There's some guys that can still play Yeah, them. but I mean, of but the new guys. But if you Denzel Best records, then you'll really learn how to play them. Mm. More his records than anyone else's. Now, Joe was a fantastic brush manipulator. And, and, and great, solid time player with the brushes. But Denzel Best, Jesus Christ, man, could he propel a band? Ooh. All that George Shearing stuff the early days, that's the guy that did it for my money, you know. Mm -hmm. And they made the sound. They, they used to like to put the left hand on a record, you know, because it sounded like surface scratch. But the way Denzel did it, George Shearing insisted that that sound be on the record. And, and that's how they made those great records. They made George famous. Mm -hmm. That cocktail band voicing, but uh, Denzel Best's propelling beat there, he's really something on those records. But he's a hell of a drummer besides that, you know. Besides being a brush drummer, he's a hell of a drummer. How about Louis Belson? Yeah, I'm not as big a fan of his as, as, as I am those other guys. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's a tremendous technician, is what I like about his playing. Mm -hmm. Tremendous technician. What a snare drum player. Whew, jeez. <laughs> One of the best, you know. One of the very best. I've heard him up against Jeff Beccaro and uh, a few other guys who are red hot out here. Louis just put him in his back pocket, man, you know. <laughs> they were so much finesse. These guys were crude. Next to, like most rock and rollers are crude, you know. <laughs> crude claws. Well, this guy was, oh, what finesse. Well, they were a good drummer with a nice uh, sound and, and feeling and, and finesse. A guy named Jimmy Keltner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jim Keltner. He's the closest thing to Billy Gladstone, I know. What a beautiful tone. He gets a tone out of anything, man. Mm. Glass out of a piece of tin. A beautiful, beautiful player, this guy. <coughs> How about Don Lamont? Who? Oh, Don Lamont, greatest big band drummer ever lived. And those aren't my words, those are Buddy Rich's words. I'm just quoting Buddy Rich, but I have to agree with him 100%. Greatest big band drummer. I got my record right, I'm looking at it right now, called Ted McNabb and Company. Play that every day and I still can't figure out what he's doing, and it's still dynamic. You know? Where is it, Ted what? Ted McNabb and Company. If you can, I, I, cost me $110 for the album. Whew. Spell the last name, M-C... Uh, M-C-N-A-B-B, -B, Ted McNabb and Company. What did he Ted play? Ted is, uh, is a guy who worked for um, Bell Packet. Ah. Alan Howell Packet, you know. Ah. And uh, he loved jazz, amateur tenor player. So I got Marion Evans to get a whole bunch of New York guys together, Herbie Green and Nat Pierce and Zoot Sims and Al Cohn, uh, you know, a whole bunch of guys. And uh, Don Lamont, Bill Hinton, and a slew of guys, and they made, put a whole bunch of arrangements of standards together and uh, put it on under his name as a private. It wasn't for the market. It wasn't for the open market. <laughs> private recording. So you, you can pick him up. You can find him. Don Lamont. But then you get the Don Lamont stuff he made in the 40s with Woody Herman. It, was the, it changed the drumming all around. It just changed, put it off in a new direction. Even Buddy Rich changed his old style after Don Lamont came on. <laughs> you know, you can hear Buddy on uh, karaoke with Les Brown in the 40s, you know. You swear it's Don Lamont. I, I didn't know it was Buddy Rich, I'll tell you that. Hmm. One of Buddy's greatest records, you know. Hmm. But he's with Les Brown in that one, you know. Right. Carry on. That's Buddy Rich, and that's and he sounded like Don Lamont. And, you know, this sensation. Mel Lewis. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of Mel Lewis. They used to put me to sleep. Tell you the truth. Hmm. Yeah, I know most guys are from shooting me if I'm hearing that. But that's no, okay. you can print it. Don't worry about that's it. That's the way I like it, though. I, you know, I don't want I, it all. I, I thought it a very lazy sound. Hmm. A lot of guys call it looseness. I didn't call it looseness. I got a feeling it was always slowing down. But uh, I like that pepper and I got a draw, you know. Mm -hmm. Kenny Clark, Philly Joe Jones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those guys not me. Philly Joe Jones is a great drummer. Let's talk about him. Yeah, oh, he's a great drummer. Yeah, very, very, very funny guy, too. <laughs> I first heard him when he joined Miles in Boston. He, he was with him a little while. And they just had Joe Jones. He was Joe. I thought it was Joe Jones, but it was down. It was this strange guy. You know? Two bongos, snare drum, top tom, and a, and a floor tom, rather. And a, and a snare drum and a bass drum. Symbols and a hi hat, and he just played the hell out of the drums. Jesus Christ, what a great drummer! Never heard anything like that. 
and then they had Red Garland, and it was John Coltrane's opening night with the group. Sonny Rollins' name was still on the sign, you know. Mm -hmm. So Coltrane wants to play in that crazy style he eventually came up with, you know. He just started there swinging. Solid player, you know. They had a little more than my uh, cup of tea, you know. Mm -hmm. But Philly Joe Jones was definitely the, the guy in that band, and that piano player was great. Red Garland, he was swinging. And Miles played pretty good, you know, he played good. But, uh, the other guys were really, that rhythm section was sensational. Mm -hmm. You know, mostly because of Joe, you know. But he went a little nuts, too, later on, you know. But he was sensational then. He ruled the roost in those days. Maybe that's why Kenny Clark left for uh, Europe. <laughs> really, you know. It's really Joe Jones just taking over all the record dates. Uh huh. Huh. How about Art Blakey? Yeah, he's a sensational drummer. Night at Birdland, I think, is his height. From the Night at Birdland album. Uh-huh. I think that's the height, his height of his playing. Just sensational. But I went down there and heard him uh, with Buddy Rich. I was a Buddy Rich, and uh, uh, you suffer when you play next to Buddy Rich. <laughs> Buddy was so spectacular. I mean, the artist, you know, nothing he could do. You just do your job, that's it. Right. But he was out there trying to cut him. You know, uh, you know, Art. Trying to cut Buddy doing this. Jesus Christ. Buddy went right from his drum set over to Art's drum set and played. It sounded better, you know? Oh, that's what Buddy Rich was. <laughs> you know, you swap drum sets. Uh, swap drum sets in the middle of the solo. Jeez. But he finished up on Art's stuff and made the drum set sound fantastic. Jesus, what a drummer he was. What blew me away about him is I, I saw him just before he died, and Christ, he still had the same technique yeah, as when yeah, I saw him back in the 60s. Yeah. yeah, me too. I saw him right before he uh, How could he do that at that age? I don't age? know. That's him. You know, that's him. He was way overweight. He looked like he was ready to die then, and, yeah. and he would just go around that set like, Oof. Oh, he was unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, well, he was just going back. He was uh, retrenching, I think. He was going back to what he used to did with Tommy because uh, he got a big nice set of drums he had with Tommy Dorff right. in the same style. Right. He was happy as a lock. The only thing was they brought the electric bass in you could, and even though the guys got so loud they're drowning Buddy out. You yeah. Know? yeah. Buddy was pounding harder. That's what probably helped put him in his early grave. <laughs> He's pounding harder. You know? Yeah. I said, why don't you just tell that guy to shut that thing off and play like he used to. Really? Get an acoustic bass. Oh, I like bass. a loud bass. I like a loud bass. Yeah, get an acoustic. Oh. Yeah. And last night we played a job and Jesus. Uh, Two wires the guy had to went in, and the bass neither one of them worked. You know, they got another set, and it kept buzzing and buzzing. So he just pulled them out. He says, oh, "Let me just try this like this." And it was acoustic all night. And it was so beautiful. Bill Berry just took the mic and threw it away. He just played acoustic. Mm. And we pulled the mic off the piano. We just played. It was mm. beautiful. Oh, we played the sound we used to get in the forties. Yeah. So easy to play, and people loved it. The few that were there, you know. But geez, it was now it was a ball, you know. And some guy came in and sang. He used the mic, and it threw everything off. You know, we started. We get that balance back. The minute he stopped, we were fine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but acoustic music, nothing like it. Yeah. But it's got to be played in small places, you know, where the people can hear you. Can't, right. Can't go outdoors and no. can't hear anything out there. No. That's the silliest thing I ever saw in my life, trying to make me play music outdoors. And yeah. Huge arenas and all that. It's not for music. It's for boxing and the hockey and football <laughs> and shit like that. And uh, they get these rock bands out there. Well, that's what they should be. Well, they should be. Well, right. Yeah. Right. About Roy Hart. Yeah, you can have him, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Chuck Flores. Uh, he's a good drummer, especially with Woody. I think his best days were with Woody. That's right, he played Gretsch, Chuck. I think he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. Sam Yolano. Oh, fuck him, he's an asshole. <laughs> he's a fucking idiot. So is Roy Hart, put that in there, too. <laughs> Jesus Christ, he's a cheap, cheap prick. Who was it that Elvin Jones said? Uh, oh, yeah, he's a funny man. Yeah, he says, uh, <laughs> he's when, I was said, when I said Sam Ulano, he says, oh, the Book of the Month Club. Yeah, Book of the Month Club. <laughs> <laughs> the Book of the Month by the Bum of the Month. Jeez, oh, this Book of the Month Club. That's funny, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Elvino Ray Jones. Elvino Ray Jones. He had a lot of good things to say about you. Yeah, well, he's a great fucking guy, man. I love that guy. Jeez. Let's talk about him. Oh, I just yeah. interviewed him last weekend. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think he's as crazy as the day is long. <laughs> Oh, I like him. I was a big fan of his brother, the trumpet player, but his other brother is just a great will. My, one of my favorite people of all time. Henry, you know. Yeah, Henry, uh, yeah. Elvin is a great cat, too, man. I'm sorry. He's just a warm guy, man. Yeah, he is. He's a beautiful human being. I had a very funny cat. <laughs> Jesus, what a funny man. Uh, somebody told me he laid Jerry Mulligan out one time. They had to carry Jerry out of the bus. He knocked him cold. <laughs> 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 Somebody told me. Yeah. I don't know if it's true. It might be true too. But I know an Elvin. It probably is. He's a very abrupt guy. You know, you can't fuck with him. You know, and I don't know why anybody would want him. You know. 
I know he's such a sweetheart. Yeah, oh, no, he's a nice guy. You know how Jerry Starr was telling everybody how to play. So oh, really? You don't tell that to Alvin. He's playing his own way. Yeah. So you're doing this wrong, he ain't doing anything wrong, because it comes out right. So how can he be doing it wrong? Yeah. You know, tell Rocky Marciano, tell Rocky Marciano, he doesn't know how to fight. <laughs> you're not doing this right, Rocky. <laughs> he's just, he's just counting, they're counting you out, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, he's unorthodox, but so it works. Didn't nobody ever beat him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh Hell of a sense of time. Who's that? Elvin. Oh, Elvin. Elvin. Oh, yeah, he does, yeah. Very unique player, you know, very unique. He's the only guy that really plays like that. There's a million guys trying to copy it. They just don't pull it off. Just don't pull it off at all. Got a lot of straight-ahead energy. A lot of in intensity when he plays. Hmm. A lot of people don't have that. You know? Right. And he still has I don't has play it. anything like him because he gets, I don't... I can't play anything like him. The guys I work with wouldn't tolerate that. Right. And I don't work with guys... Right. That are in that area, right? Yes, you know, I work with the whole different uh, Count Basie style. Of what mm -hmm. I, what I, and Alvin just wouldn't work with that kind of a man. No, he didn't uh, really work out with even with his brother's man. He didn't work out too well. And now, I, which one, Thad or Henry? Yeah, Thad. Thad, yeah. yeah. No, he worked fine with, with Hank. Mm -hmm. No, they, they they play fine together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they're, they're fine. They're excellent. Yeah, he sure is a nice guy. I love the guy. He's, he's, and he's got a nice wife that helps sets up the drums. Yes, yeah, she does. Who else can make that claim? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Most most wives are trying to sell them. Like, yeah, no. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, guy said, uh, guy said, uh, I was talking to Buddy Rich one time. Says, you know, Buddy, said, you've been back with Slingland. You're responsible for the sale of more drum sets than any guy ever. Because I know I sold mine after I heard you. Play. <laughs> <laughs> you always like, always like that. Uh, Great line. I love that one. Yeah, yeah, it's an old one, but it works with him. I love that. As long as you don't try to pull the joke on him, it's okay. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Laugh at anything long than anything. Else, you know. <laughs> uh, he was a nice cat too. Yeah, after when after he said Sam Milano was book of the month, he said he when when I got to your name, he says, "Oh, the joke of the month." The joke of the month. Yeah, I got a joke of the month. He said you always just <laughs> add him in stitches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but yeah, he's a funny guy. Yeah. Funny guy. Bill Richmond. Bill Richmond. Yeah, he's uh, still out here, I think. You know, he he wound up. Uh, well, I heard him with less years ago, and he did a pretty fair job on Les. Les Brown, yeah. Jack Spilling was the main guy there back, way back. Uh, but, and Bill came in after Jack, I believe. Jack. Or maybe after Lloyd Morales. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think Bill... Let me see. No, no, Lloyd followed Bill. Lloyd for Bill was with him about 1954, I think. Is Bill still playing? No, he's... Uh, he was a comedy writer for Jerry Lewis for years. Well, he was a drummer for Jerry Lewis and a comedy writer for Jerry. Huh. Then he had a comedy writer... Then he was a comedy writer for over at CBS. Then he became one of the head comedy writers over there. Then Whitey Mitchell, remember Whitey, the bass player, mm -hmm. Rich brother? Mm -hmm. He became a comedy writer. He became the head comedy writer over there, and he ran all the shows. And I think Bill wound up working with him or for him or something. I know a couple of those guys were comedy writers, and one of the guys, Bill, uh, I can't think of his last name. I used to be the band boy for Claude Thornhill and those guys. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he was a good comedy writer. Bill Larkin. Bill Larkin, yeah, he was a drummer and a uh, uh, band boy when but Irv Cotton was the drummer for for, um, uh, for Claude Thornhill, you know. He was, <laughs> but then he'd been in a comedy. Bill Richmond was in comedy. Whitey, all these jazz musicians are comedy writers. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Pratt. Jimmy, gee, I, I don't know that guy, but I sure liked his playing. I got a real good Zoot Sims record with him on there. He sounds great. And I think he'd shot a sort of throw the towel in on it. Tell you the truth, he made a real nice bass drum muffler. Right. For uh, Gretchen. Right. It's the best one made so far that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I don't see them in the drums anymore. Yeah. Know? And they really should have. They were very good. Very good. The Jimmy Jimmy Pratt muffler. Yeah. Is he's he still around, do you know? Side. Don't know, but if he is, he's out here. Somebody said he was down in San Diego. Well, he might be down in that. Well, no, that's Jim Plank. Ah. Uh, Jimmy Plank. Uh. Yeah. Hey, Charlie, get off of that there. I got, I'm reading a Woody Herman book just came out yesterday, and it's uh, very good. Uh, my cat is on the... Uh, it's Flip Phillips' book, and I, I don't want to get the cat to scratch up the cover. Yeah, on. really, yeah. Get off the cover there, Charlie. Get off. Okay, How about Charlie on. Smith? Oh, yeah, he's a great drummer. Southpaw. Very good brush drummer, you know. Very good brush drummer. Those things you see with uh, Charlie Parker and Nizzy Gillespie on the TV and all those, that's Charlie on the drums. He's hmm. Dick Hyman and a, and a local guy, a terrible bass player, but Charlie's wailing away. You can see, he was a hell of a cat, hell of a drummer, hell of a character, you know. Hmm. Hell of a character. Very good drummer. Very, very good drummer. He's from up around, I think, Hartford or New Haven or somewhere around that area. Mm -hmm. 
Sam Wood passed away pretty early. He, yeah. Charlie Smith did. Yeah, yeah, he died quite a few years ago. Huh. Sam Woodyard. Oh yeah, yeah, one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. Oh, I loved that guy. Loved him. I used to show from around out here. Is that a fact? Oh sure. Yeah, we were very good friends. Very good friends. He's. I even subbed for him for Duke for about ten days once. When they trying to find him, <clears throat> they found him. I had to leave. You know, he was a great drummer. And he was out here in Scuffling, so Buddy Rich picked him up. And they used two drummers, Buddy and him. And so Buddy had him get a set of drums, and he says, play what you want to play. He's going to the drum shop, pick him up, so he'd come down and get the two bass drums and all the stuff he used to use with Duke. They had two sets of drums up there, and he used to play their things, their battles, and Sam would play with the band, just swinging. And he took him back to New York when he got there. I went up a record date, and there was Sam playing on a conga drum, you know. <laughs> and Buddy doing a record date. You had a whole bunch of guys on this record date, you know. We happened to be in town with Super Sacks. And he invited me up to see the guy. Joe Romano was there, a few guys I knew, you know. And Sam was still there, still with the band. But then that's when he was getting off. And he got off and went over to Paris and uh, lived and died over there. Huh. Yeah. Nice guy, very funny guy. Very, very funny guy. One of the, I think he's the greatest drummer Duke Ellington had. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Sonny, Sonny Greer was also pretty sensational with that band. But I think Sam was the guy, you know. Huh. Sam would, yeah, was the guy. He could swing, that's for Oh, sure. couldn't he swing? Oh, I love him. Jeez, I love him. <laughs> um, Max Roach. Yeah, oh yeah, well, he's the innovator. He's the guy that... <laughs> my teacher used to say, if anything's gonna be, anything new is going to be done, Max will do it. <laughs> <laughs> he's the guy that started all this stuff, you know. Kenny Clark was the guy, but mostly in a swinging mode. Max actually took it into the... where it is now, you know, with the bop. The bop was from the 40s in there. He a really great... Uh, of course, when you got that band with Clifford Brown and Sonny Rollins, that, that made musical history for my money. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of the best bands I ever heard. Max was just sensational on those things. Just sensational. Jeez, what a great drummer. What's he doing now? I never see this guy anymore. I tried to get him for an interview, and at first he said he'd do it, but he's doing his autobiography, and his publisher, oh, yeah? Yeah, his publisher said that he can't get involved in any of the other books until his, his autobiography is published. Yeah. But he says, Chet, he says, he says, I'm thinking of giving up playing the drums. I said, what? But what? what? He says, because now all I have to do is walk up on the stage and I get a standing ovation. He yeah. says, why should I play the fucking drums? <laughs> <laughs> Just walk around getting ovation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just walk around getting ovation. God, I, I sure could relate to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the last time I saw him was at Frank and Belito's funeral. That's the last time I saw him. Yeah. That's the last time I saw the guy. He looked terrific, too. Yeah? Yeah. Jimmy Cobb. Yeah, Jimmy's an excellent drummer. I haven't seen him in many years. I, I, maybe i ask you, what the hell's he doing? I, I just, I had an interview with him last weekend. What's he's, he saying? He's, he's on his tour. He's going over to, to Paris. Oh, yeah? Who's he with? Um, you know, I didn't even ask him. Oh, yeah. He was uh, in a big hurry. We were talking about him last night. You know, he's a nice guy. Yeah, he's a real he's nice a real guy. nice guy and a real good feeling on those drums. I was over in Nice one year, and I'm Walking around the back, I said, gee, I think I'll go over here. Mark Police plays. He's a drummer, Pulley, P-U-L-I-C-E. I go, here, Mark Police. I took Scott Hamilton with me. He says, yeah, boy, that guy sounds like he's really swinging. And I went around the corner. I says, wait a minute. No, no, that, that to me sounded like only one guy. That sounded like Jimmy Cobb. And so I went around the corner. Sure enough, it's Jimmy Cobb playing with somebody. And I yelled yell at him. I said, I knew that was you, you son of a gun. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was good to see this guy. He's always, always a nice cat. Always a nice cat. He had to take over on that uh, Porgy and Bess album from Philly Joe, right? Uh, who did? Jimmy? Jimmy Cobb. Mm, very possible. Very Miles possible. Davis, Porgy and Bess. Yeah, very possible. Yeah, he Philly told Joe, you know, if Joe, how Joe was in those days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he might have taken over on that thing. Uh, it might have been Art Taylor. Did Art Taylor take over on it? No, I, didn't, no, I, think, it was, uh, I think it was Jimmy Cobb. Yeah. Hmm. Tony Williams. Yeah, very good, very good drummer. I drove down to New York, you know. Carried his drums up to six flights of stairs. Brought him down with Toshiko. We came down with Toshiko, Charlie Mariano, Gene Chirigo, Tony, and myself. I was coming back to New York. I just went up visiting and so on. I saw them over at Conley's on the avenue with their little group, and Tony was a drummer. So they brought him down to join a group, a show called The Connection with Jackie McLean, and that's how he got into New York. And it was at Conley's? Conley's was in Boston on, on, on Columbus Avenue. Ah. I went in to see the group then. I said, well, what are you guys, uh, what are you doing? He said, well, we got to go to New York uh, tomorrow. I said, Jesus Christ, give me a ride down there. You <laughs> can drop me off at my place. And I lived right up near Tony. Huh? I lived across the street from Miles Davis. Uh -huh. And Tony, we brought Tony's drums up to Gene Chirico's place. And Miles Davis gave him a spot 
in his building. Somewhere in his, somewhere near his building. He owned a whole big brownstone, you know. And eventually he joined Miles Davis. Right. Yeah. Huh. Chico Hamilton. Yeah, I can't stand him. No. <laughs> Personally or musically. But musically, I think he's a shock. I really do. Yeah. I think he's a jiver. Yeah. Just terrible. I don't care if he had a cello in his band or not. The band stunk and so did he. <laughs> the thing was awful. We were in Toronto one time. He had a kid lived next door to me, Eric Dolphy, you know. Lived next door to me in a hotel. Used to practice that weird bass clarinet. I'd call up the maid every day and I'd try to get some sleep. I had a hangover anyway. And I said, hey, come on up and clean my room. And I'd give him his room number. And so she'd come up, boom, 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 with the vacuum cleaner going, he'd leave. <laughs> so I'd get a little, I'd, I'd rather hear the vacuum cleaner. But we, he was working at Tom Tavern with this jive group and all that. Oh, God. Jesus. Call Jimmy Hall about him, boy. He'll tell you some hilarious stories. Jesus Christ. God damn it. Jimmy, you couldn't believe this guy. Oh, great. Yeah, I can get nothing out of him. Huh. Really nothing. Charlie Perry. Yeah, Charlie's a very good drummer. Very good drummer. Excellent teacher. He's got a kid out there now named Joe Ancioni. You've got to hear play. What a drummer he is. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Ooh, that's the... Uh, he does a few things that Buddy can't do, you know. Ooh. Buddy, he was traveling with Buddy for a while. Buddy's just crazy about him. Uh, he didn't like many guys, you know. Charlie P- is uh, Charlie Perry still alive? Oh, sure, yeah. Do you oh, know where Charlie's he is? He's on the island. You ought to give him a call. He's a hell of a nice cat. He's where? He's out on the island, Long Island. Yeah, you can find his name somewhere in the New York. Uh, 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 you got a New York uh, book? No. The uh, Union book? No. Uh, uh, his, his, his name's there somewhere. Okay. Yeah, he's a nice cat, Charlie. Oh, you, you get a big kick out of him because he knows more about all that stuff than I, I ever would, you know, because mm. he was always working Birdland. Like, you know, Miles Davis really liked the way Charlie played. You know, he had Max up there playing with him one night, and it wasn't Miles' band, it was Charlie Parker's band, you know. And Charlie's playing with the other band, and Miles walked up with his band, and says, you swing. He says, well, man, you know, I'm listening to you, because you, you swing, that's more I can say about our guy, you know. Mm. <laughs> you know, because Max is an excellent timekeeper, but he doesn't get the swing Charlie got. Charlie's a very good drummer, very good drummer. Sonny Payne. No, I couldn't stand him. Really? Very stiff, very stiff drummer. Very stiff, real showboater. Real showboater. Don Lamont said he always looked like a clown up there doing a clown act. In fact, <laughs> I was talking to Billy Mitchell one night, and he was with the band, you know, Count Basie's band up in, uh, we were up in, uh, where Woody Herman, he was uh, he was up there with, uh, in Lake Tahoe, you know. He was up there with Count Basie. Out, out front, I said, what do you think about fucking drummer? He said, I said, tell you the truth, Billy, if it wasn't for the band, the drummer would fall apart. And he got the biggest kick out of that. He had to tell Count Basie and all the other guys. But he was a great show with that. He was the, he was the guy to put that band on the map for my money. You know, he did April in Paris. I saw him when he first, you know, when he was first with the band. Joe Williams' first night of the band in Kansas City. First night. And Joe was the guy that, uh, you know, got off. He eventually took off and became very big with every day. But in those days, it was April in Paris was the, was the tune that killed everybody, and Sonny Payne was the guy that made it go, you know, but a very stiff drummer, very stiff. What, what, he's a good band, a good big band stylist is what he was. Mm-hmm. If you got him in a combo, he's, he's, he's right out of fish out of water. Mm-hmm. So, sort of like Buddy was with a, with a quintet, you know, mm-hmm. sort, of, sort of out of water too, you know. He kept playing like Mr. Tommy Dawson. He's still waiting for his five brass to come in, and there's only a vibe player and a flute player, you know. But uh, this guy was a very stiff drummer. He was not a bad guy, you know. Very stiff drummer. Hmm. But he was the biggest show at Basie. He was the biggest thing Basie had except for Joe Williams. Right. <laughs> Art Taylor. I'm not a big Art Taylor fan. No, he's a very good, competent drummer, but I'm not a big fan of his. Mm-hmm. You know, he just died. Yeah, I know he did. Yeah. 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 He got his wrote a book in it. Right. I saw him over in uh, Vienna with uh, Tommy Flanagan and uh, Crazy George, George Moraz, and him, and uh, Al Cohn and I were listening to it. I sounds pretty good, doesn't it, Al? And Al just says, I was never a fan of that drummer. He says, I never. Hmm. And it's rare, because Al likes everybody, you know, whether they can play or they can't. He says, I was never a fan of that guy. Hmm. Charlie Percet. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of Charlie Percet. See, I know he's got a great foot and buddy, which is nuts about him, but I gotta have a guy keep a little better time than that man, you know. It's okay to rush and drag, as long as it's swinging. But uh, he, he, he goes too far. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing now. I really don't, couldn't care less. Mm. I, could, you know, I just found him a little bit jive, you know. Mm-hmm. 
How about people inside the company? Who, who's your oh, contact? Oh, Phil Grant. Phil Grant, Phil yeah. Grant. Of course, Al Moffat is one of my oldest best friends. And he was a good pal of, of, of friends, you know. Who's this Al Moffat? Al Moffat, yeah. He started out with Gretsch years and years ago. And then he went over to Slingham. He was a he was a number one salesman in the music business, man. You know that? Huh. Number one salesman in the music business, regardless of instrument. Now, he was a salesman for Fred Gretsch? That's right. Salesman for Fred put Gretsch on the map, man. Put Gretsch on the map. Phil Gretsch, the guy didn't know how to do all that. He got Chuck Stewart, the photographer, and got those funny drum... You see those drum ads with the drums are all over the place, and the guys are laying down, sitting down, and they uh -huh. got, how to get something, the drums are disassembled. Uh -huh. That's all Chuck Stewart and uh, Phil Grant. But Phil Grant was a great guy, and uh, he was a hell of a drummer. He was a hell of a legitimate drummer. He loved Billy Gladstone. And they made a Gretsch Gladstone, too. Right. For Billy, you know. Made a whole set. Made a whole set of Gretsch Gladstone. Wood rims, you know. Right. Billy, if you get Billy's stuff, that's the real thing, because he has the real three-ply shell. Yeah, right. Gretsch has a three-ply shell, but remember, Billy's inner ply was ebony. That's why the shell never went out of round. <sighs> it was maple, ebony, maple. And you'll see it if you look, in, in a, in the, you look down the shell, you see the inner ply is black. That's a piece of ebony. <clears throat> if you got a wood drum, you know, the regular wood drum. Right. See that in a ply is, uh, is, is black ebony, and that's what kept the drum very round. But Gretsch just used uh, three maple, uh, three uh, three ply maple. Right. Phil Grant. Phil Grant said that uh, Billy Gladstone was the best snare drum player in the world, and he said, "And I'm and I'm number two. Are I you? would just about believe it. Wow. I would believe that. Wow. That's how good Phil Grant was. Gee, many Chris. Yeah. That's why he he hated Samuel Arnold. Actually, he hated him with a passion. If he could have got a gun, I think he'd have shot. I really do. He, he was vehement about him. Vehement. He said, that guy's an insult to the music business, insult to drummers, insult to everything. He, just, he's, he should not be allowed to be perform anywhere or even teach. He should be put in prison. He just hated him. Because he did everything as bad as you could possibly do and put down Billy Gladstone. Called Billy Gladstone a phony and bullshitter. Get out of here. Man, I, I, I got so mad, I almost wanted to hit him one day. And he had all his students there. They're all laughing, you know. I'm walking up the street, and there's this number one student outside Burnland talking to Buddy Rich, and I see this kid there. And it just happened that afternoon, you know, this, this, this incident. I walked up to Buddy, he says, Buddy, guess who I saw in Boston? This guy's looking at me, he's still got that grimace, you know. And I, he says, I, I give up. I says, Billy Gladstone. He says, man, Buddy Rich did that, and he kissed the air. You know how the guy you do, you blow a kiss. Right. Greatest fucking drummer of all time. I thought a kid's face dropped. This kid left New York, man. You know that? <laughs> he left New York. Sonny Carr was his name. He fucking left New York and went back home with his tail between his legs. He'd been studying with the wrong guy, listening to all the wrong information. Wow. All and Buddy Richard, he idolized it. Buddy just went, oh, man, threw his hands to the heavens. He says, the greatest fucking drummer of all time. Best I ever heard. He's, how's he feeling and all that shit, you know? Yeah. But Buddy Rich, thank God for Buddy Rich. Yeah. He's crazy. Yeah. You know, these other guys were clowns. Uh, there was a drummer in um, uh, Detroit, and George Hamilton was a fine uh, snare drummer, too. Yeah, he had a fine role. But I'd say Phil Grant was just was crazy. He was great. He was a great drummer, yeah. Good guy, too. He, oh, yeah. Fine guy. Fine guy. He's got a, he's got a, a general merchandise store up in Vermont. That's right. That's he says, right. Is he still alive? Yeah, he says... I, I'd love him. Yeah, I got, I got an interview with him, and he says, uh, I, it's, I sell everything but drums. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he's a, got a little story. Always wanted to do that. Yep. Sit out the porch and have what the people come by and do whatever he wanted to do. What a great guy! Yeah, oh, that's what yeah. he's doing. Williamsburg. That's where they were. We used to go over to see him all the time. He, he got my Gladstone and fixed it all up for me, brand new. Mm. Jesus, yeah. Oh, he's a great guy. Just a great guy. Christ's sake, yeah. He, he loved Jack Adams and Boss. Got Jack so more Gretsch drums than anybody. Anybody in America. Yeah, they had Jack Adams listed as an endorser, but I think it was just because he sold more friggin' drums. Oh, yeah, he sold more drums than anybody used. He was just a great guy, too. And he loved Phil. Phil Grant was a great guy, man. So him and uh, Al Moffat, Jesus Christ. But Al Moffat was a uh, roustabout. You know, he's, he's much older than Phil, and he passed away a few years ago. But uh, he, he, he hangs with the Zuljans, so you know what that's like. You know, Armand Zuljan, those are your ice sake. That's total insanity. <laughs> you know, fucking Jesus. <laughs> Oh, what parties those guys had. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, boy, Jesus. Yeah. Al knew everybody in the world. Right up to the White House. Those guys at West Point. He just sold a lot of stuff to these people. He was something else, this guy. And he was a fine drummer, too, you know. 
he's one of the NAID top guys. This is all, all the interviews I've had, his name has never come up. Oh, Al Moffat's one of the main guys, sure. He's, yeah, he was great for a long time. He helped put them on the map. Then he went over to Slingham, the Bud Slingham. When was that, do you know? Do you remember? Oh, let me see, I was a great player for years, and I went over from there. Oh, Phil Grant got mad as a hornet at me, because Al says, how would you like to play Slingham? I said, I, I'm very satisfied with it. I'll get you everything for that. Let me call this guy. And so he had Don Osborne was there, who happened to be a fan of mine, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christ said he pushed me hard. Don Osborne pushed me pretty good. And so they did a lot more for me than uh, than Gretch ever did, you know. They were a New York area company. See, they wanted Birdland. You had to work Birdland for them. Right. You get in Birdland, do a night at Birdland, they'd give you the ads. But not Slingerland. They had uh, a little more a little more leeway. Mm -hmm. I brought a couple of people over there, but Al Moffat got me there. Mm -hmm. Great guy, Al. How'd you get with Gresh? How did how did? Oh, Jack Adams, you know. Yeah. Guys, Jack, you got to try these. They're great. They're they made good stuff then too. But uh, you know, later on, uh, when I was with Marion McFarland, these plastic heads came in. They uh, they wouldn't fit. The regular plastic heads wouldn't fit a Gretsch drum with the pearl on it. And a lot of people had a lot of complaints about them. Just to try to hammer them out, put wax on them, try everything to get them to fit. The pearl, just that little ply of pearl, was a little too made the drum a little too wide for the, for the, for the plastic. Hmm. So what they did was take it off and started finishing them off in wood right. in a beautiful finish. And they were the first guys to make that piano finish. Right. And, and it really turned out to be a blessing in disguise. <laughs> they get rid of the pearls and started putting out the wood, the wood drums, and they were beautiful, <laughs> just beautiful. But they couldn't, they wouldn't change their, uh, those big fat things there, those big round moles they had, they wouldn't change them. You know. So that's how that went. Hmm. They made a beautiful finish, like a piano finish. Just one of the best-looking drums, you know. I could never get their snare drums to play well. Me neither, me neither. Tom sound great, bass yeah, drums Tom are great. Yeah, Tom's bass were great, but I could never get the snare drums to sound good. <laughs> never. The old ones were better. Right. The ones that Dave Tuffin, those guys, play with. That, in fact, so those uh, those lugs that were the best-looking lugs ever made for any drum set, for my money. Yeah, the old broadcasters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Weren't they beautiful? Yeah. Jesus, like a diamond lug, you know. You're right. They were great. They were the best. The snare drums are very good. Very good indeed. But they're still the top snared wood snare drummers, these Swiggle and Radio King. Mm -hmm. They still made the best, you know. Mm -hmm. I still get one from 1937. It's, it's great. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves that drum. Nice calf head on there. It won't play with a plastic head, though, this drum. Because mm -hmm. it's a cut down model, see? Mm -hmm. So they only made a six and a half in those days. And this is a five. Cut down a Dave Tough size, you know. Mm -hmm. And when the guy, when Frank Ippolito, cut it down, he didn't bother to cut it down even. So, because the plastic heads seat themselves, you know. I mean, the calf heads seat themselves. Right. When you put a plastic head, they do not seat themselves. They no. <laughs> it sounds like a piece of tin on there. I couldn't get it to sound right. I took it on a drum shop, Bob Vegas now, put it on this thing in the sand. They sanded everything, and it came out pretty even, and uh, now uh, 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 plastic works good in the bottom, but I still use a calf on the top. Mm. It's a beautiful tone. Mm. And the old brass hoops, you know, nickel-plated brass hoops. Right. Straight edge, straight rim, you know, that stick breaker. Right. But they're very good. Very good. <coughs> well, Jack, I really appreciate this. You've given me a lot of good information here. Yeah, yeah. So you start off by saying you weren't going to say much, and we've been almost... Yeah, I know. Well, you brought up a lot of good yeah. guys. Yeah. A couple of assholes, but uh, most of those guys are real good guys. Most jazz, uh, most jazz musicians are good guys, especially the ones that can really play, like Dizzy and those giants, you know, Lester and uh, Zoot Sims. They're just great people, you know. Right. Gresh really had the corner on the jazz. Yes, they did, and that was Phil. That was strictly Phil. Phil Grant did that. Strictly, that was strictly Phil Grant. And he got some good guys. He got Charlie Watts now, you know, with the, uh, right. with the uh, Stones. Charlie's right. basically a jazz drummer, you know. Mm -hmm. You can see some of those old films. He's got Dave, Dave Green and him. He came over here with a real good jazz band, one of the best you'll ever hear last year. Just a, as good as you'll ever hear, you know. Great new trumpet player out of England and the best alto player in the continent, Phil. Uh, Pete King, and he had the two best rhythm guys in the whole continent, uh, uh, Brian Lemon and the Dave Green. He had a great little group. Did a whole history of Charlie Parker. Uh, I didn't get Dave. to see him. That was oh, really... Oh, you should have seen him. Yeah, I wish I could. A hell of a group. Unfortunately, we caught him in a rock venue, and the, the uh, engineer had the bass booming like a rock bass. Oh, so boy. It fucked up all the sound, but normal places they went, they, they played real, uh, real good, real good. In fact, all the people who went to see Charlie were all rock fans. They hadn't the slightest idea who Charlie Parker was. <laughs> Didn't have the slightest idea. <laughs> How did Charlie do? What? Fantastic. It was a great fucking concert. Great. Jesus. And he's got the whole, has a guy narrating everything. And 
he got an album out of it that they did over in uh, Ronnie Scott's. Just, just great. And Charlie sounded good. He stays out of the way, you know, when he plays it. He's right. Just, he just sits in the back and lets everybody blow. Never plays pause or nothing. Just likes to play. I've known Charlie since 50s or 60s, somewhere around there, hmm. when they first started. <coughs> very good, uh, very good player. He's the only good musician in that whole group. They got there. Yeah. Stones are just awful. And, yeah. Uh, and they're worse than the Beatles, you know? They really are. They're worse than the Beatles. The only trouble with those guys is they can't play their instruments. Yeah. The Beatles included. They just cannot play the instruments. The songs aren't bad that George, what's the name, wrote. You know, the uh, guy that put everything together for Person. them. Yeah. They're not bad, those songs. Yeah. But uh, the stuff they write are terrible. Beatles write rotten crap, you know. Because <laughs> if they're any good, how come they didn't come up with nothing after this guy left George? Yeah. Uh, what's his name? What's that? I forget his name. Made a lot of money. Yeah. Oh, man. And this kid, he's buying all that, those songs from that, comp- that company. But that, the whole uh, library of the company there, what is it? Uh, BMI or uh, Ask that? Ask a BMI, I think, or one of those. Uh, he's, he's making money off every tune that's played now, whether he wrote it or not. <laughs> he's a real thief, this little prick. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> And he owns the name The Beatles. That's why they can't go out anymore. Uh, he, he, while they're all looking the other way, he, he just he just copyrighted that name. That's it. This guy is... A, I don't trust him. As far as I can throw the whole continent. <laughs> Jesus. He's a bad cat, that kid. And the other guys ain't bad. You know, Ringo's a nice guy, and the, the kid that could kill wasn't a bad guy. He's yeah. the honest of them, you know. Yeah. That other guy, the bass player, was a moron, you know. Yeah. But what are you going to do? Who cares about them anyway? Yeah, you're they right. Wreck, they wreck generations of, of youth. <laughs> Everybody's a fucked up the stone head nowadays. I appreciate this. You, this is uh, you, you gave me a lot of really good stuff. Some some right. some okay. of the guys were a little too sugar coated, and, and I like I like some you know gutsy stuff once in a while. You got to throw Look that man, in there I too. I got no time to do that. Just yeah. to get a couple of extra years out of life. I know, hear uh, that. A few extra yards, as they say. Right. Uh, I ain't gonna play nothing safe for that shit. Woody Herman told me you just tell it like it is. Don't wait around like I did. <laughs> <laughs> At the end, Woody started being very honest and calling out on real bullshit, calling mm-hmm. it bullshit, bullshit. Mm-hmm. Especially the last three or four bands he had. He says, these are the worst pieces of crap I ever heard in my life, and I, I got, I'm in front of them. Mm-hmm. He says, this is not music, not even, not definitely not jazz, and precious little music coming out of these guys. Mm-hmm. Poor Sal, this guy had a rough time with him back to those rock and roll kids he'd hired. Gave him a hard time to laugh at this guy. This is one of the greatest tenor players in history. Mm-hmm. You know, these fools couldn't even hear it. You believe all that shit, man? Jeez, they can't even hear the quality, you know? Yeah. But still sitting right beside them, they can't hear it. Yeah. They're all ego. They're all ego, these guys. Precious little music. If they flex their wits like they did their egos, then they might be something. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't uh, think they have precious little wit, anyway. Yeah. Good riddance to all of them. The sooner they go, the better off uh, we'll all be. However, yeah. it's a big money-making business, I'll tell you that. That's right. That's a real music business now. Now they're really making money. Yep. Lots of notes, but none of them to do with music. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. All right, I'll get to see you a little later. All right, Jake, I really appreciate I this. Thanks so much uh, for your help. Are you located, Toronto? San Francisco. Oh, San Francisco. Yeah, yeah of course. Oh, you're yeah. in the same time area we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. All right, Jake, I really appreciate this. My Thanks pleasure. so much for your time. And uh, and like I said, when I get it finished up, I'll, I'll zip you down a copy, and, and you can... Uh, you can shred it too. I want to, you know, give me, give me some, give me some crummy comments on it too. Okay, you know, beat it up if you okay. think so. <laughs> All right. All right, Jay. Okay. See you in a minute. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye bye.